Hello, everyone. This is Chala Dinkoy, CEO and founder of The Repositioning Expert. Don't I sound much better? I am so much better for the first time ever. I slept without Otrevin. I'm like, I'm going to scream it from rooftops. I'm just so happy. One time I over relied on Otrevin and I gave myself the worst sinus infection the doctor said he had ever seen in his entire career and it lasted months it like it just and it, it became chronic so like i'm so nervous to use it but and i haven't been sick i'm never sick so i haven't been sick in years and years and years so believe it or not i used one like an otrovin from 2014 and it still worked <laughs> i'm so happy to say and i'm not dead i'm still alive it otrovin is something you squeeze into your nose and it opens up your nostrils constricts your vessels. It's not a good thing. But anyway, so um, other disaster news, there is no water in the condo. I woke up today and I had completely depleted my Brita in the fridge, my uh, kettle. I had depleted my actual water bottle next to my bedside. Drop, like not one drop in the house. And and then there's an emergency water work. I don't know what the hell kind of place I'm living in. It's supposed to be a luxury condo in Toronto, which is like one of the most expensive markets. But anyway, so I've got this, what I've been drinking. I, I don't even have tea water. So there's no Tuesday tea time. This is like Tuesday, whatever you can find uh, to drink time. I had to like take some, boil some water from the fridge to, uh, you know, wash my hands, just warm it up just to wash my face in the morning. It was just so that's how ridiculous don't even ask about the bathroom situation i'm not even going to go there because it's it's bad yeah it's going to have to we're, we're waiting for the uh water to come back in an, in about two hours so pray pray hard and there's going to be a lot of cleaning happening after okay so what do we have today i have a really fun uh topic my uh my little guy is um he's off he's in a private school so they have weird um, breaks. So he's on break this week and uh, he's at uh, his um, math tutoring. So I took the advantage of the time that he's gone to, um, so I don't bother him because we live in a small place. So I'm doing this now, but we've been taking his big uh, love is trains. So we've been taking transit um, as sort of like to keep him busy. So he's not on computers all day. So I thought about, some of these things I, I was thinking about, okay, what, what am I going to do? And it also feeds into some of the conversations that I've had with clients. So I really like this topic of four stupid questions to ask a buyer because not only am I, have I been a buyer of services for 18 years with people asking me really stupid questions. And, you know, when I say stupid questions, obviously I'm positioning it to teach you something. So take it as a learning, don't take it as a, an offensive thing. Uh, it's just a way, it's a, it's a way to get your attention, but it, you know, it is also how I feel, but not only that, but I've been working with, uh, diversity, um, uh, groups. So, you know, uh, if you're woman owned, if you're LGBT, if you're African-American owned or Latino owned or veteran owned, I've been working with these companies and buyers of large corporations to match, make them together. And I talk to, and I'm hired by a lot of buying, like buyer teams, like actual buyers. And I talk to them all the time about this topic. And in fact, we're putting together a, we've put together a seminar for um, the WeBank uh, Atlanta conference where my, uh, the, the buyer team from Capital One and I will be doing a co-presentation together about these, you know, the pet peeves of buyers. So I feel really qualified to be able to talk about this topic and, uh, you know, maybe, you know, maybe the topic is a little contentious, but it's just to get your attention. So I promise you there's some nuggets of good information in there. So the first stupid question that you could ask a buyer, and this is verbatim from the, the horse's mouth. And it really mostly pertains to, uh, you know, the round tables and those mass meeting situations is if you're, you're in a networking situation, or if you're in a matchmaking situation or a round table situation, the one stupid question that they find they hate is what is it that you guys do? Now, if you are a bigger company, and you're already meeting with the company, obviously, you've researched them. But what I'm saying is, if you're in the vicinity of a company and you're 
even if you do know you're going to be match made with them, one of the biggest questions they get that they hate is what is it that you do? Needless to say, and I know I start with that because it's so obvious, right? It's so obvious that you should know what they do. Not only should you know what they do, but you should know their biggest problem that you can solve. And every training that I give with elevator sp speeches and pitches is that it takes so few seconds. I remember one of my books is called It Takes Seven Seconds to Make How to Make Anyone Like You in Seven Seconds or Less. It takes so, so few seconds for them to lose attention right up front. You want the first words out of your mouth not to be what is it that you do, but it, for it to be something around their pain and to ask them around their pain. So say like four out of five of you guys are in this boat, in this pain. And what we do is we fix that pain by doing X, Y, Z. Are you guys also in this position? So, uh, and if you're in a, like a, a full sales meeting, you should have done the whole workup of all the industry pain points, how case studies of how you've helped solve it and so on and so on. So in terms of questions that you're asking them, I'm all about questions. I mean, the way that I teach sales is the five question sales methodology that I learned and I adapted and I added to, and it works. And it works for clients who are closing, you know, dream clients like, you know, Ferrari, all the way to just regular clients and signing up $100,000, $200,000 a year clients. So and that's what I call regular clients instead of like million dollar clients. It works. Questions are all what you all about what you have to do. But if you're asking the wrong questions or they're, they're wrongly positioned, it can really backfire on you. OK, uh, stupid question to ask a buyer. Number two is, can I tell you a little about us? Whenever I find a client is doing a presentation and they send me their deck, their presentation deck, the first thing I take out is the about us. And I put it way in the back. The reason why you should not be wasting their time talking about you is so is so that you talk about them. It's all about them, right? So it's a stupid question because you should never be asking them if you could talk about yourself. You only talk about yourself within the context of the stories that you tell where you helped clients by solving the same problem that they have that they have that you actually solved and what the results were. You position yourself as the expert who took them from the pain to the pleasure. Great. But you don't ask them if you can tell them about yourself. I always throw that into the appendix. I always throw that into the leave behind. If it's within context, great. And we do have a why work with us slide in the end of a capability presentation. If you want to highlight any, but all of that, you can still highlight in the stories. Let's say you won an award. You can say, as a result, we won an award and they won an award, whatever. Of course, the results should relate to the pain and to the, the actual client, but you can definitely bake in everything about you, including your differentiators, your different processes, your, um, you know, whatever awards and media mentions and special training and or special methodology, those need to be baked in to the story. So you never have to ask them if you can tell them about yourself. I always say have self amnesia. OK, um, stupid question number three to ask a buyer is how much is your budget for this now? On the surface, this may not seem like a stupid question, right? Let me let me get to what I'm talking about. So remember, I'm trying to a little bit rile you up so I can get your attention with some of these topics, but also I'm repositioning how you're doing your sales um, conversations to add value. So how much is your budget for this is a wrong question, in my opinion, because while 17% while the close rate for sales meetings that involve the that talk about numbers is 17% higher than those that don't, the context in which I want you to ask about the budget is by co-creating the solution and the scope of work together, back of the envelope together, and giving it a range of a price that's somewhat realistic based on all the stuff that you've done in the past, and then asking them the question, which piece of this would you like to bite off right now? 
To me, that is 100% way more involved. It involves a lot more detail. It involves layers. You're asking for their input into a scope of work that you are doing and together so that they can stand behind. And then they can see fleshed out what is involved, what are all the steps, what are all the parameters, what are all the different variables. And then you give it a range of price and then ask them which piece of this would you like to bite off? And then they will tell you either, oh, I can, you know, this year I can do maybe 10% of that. Or they say, oh my gosh, this is no problem at all. We can start this tomorrow, the whole thing. So you give them the whole enchilada price. So that's my way of much better way of talking about price, handling price, and then overcoming price objections if you need to, because how likely are they to protest if they've been part of building it together? And if they are part of picking which piece to start with, because if you've gone that far into the conversation as to build and co-create a solution, they're really committed to doing this, at least at some level with you. And they need your expertise and they're in enough pain to sit there and do this with you and give you that time. So it's a really, really good sign that they're doing that. And so the next net natural question is for them to give you a green light on which piece of it that they'd like to bite off right now. So don't ask them how much open-ended question. Don't ask him that. How much is the budget? Okay. And last stupid question that you should not ask a buyer is where do I email my proposal? And there are so many things wrong with that question. I don't even know where to start. First of all, you should never, ever, ever, ever be emailing your proposal because all people do when you email a proposal is just look at the price in the bottom and compare it with everybody else's. So if you don't want to have the chance to differentiate yourself from everybody else, if you don't want to have a chance to overcome their price objection, if you don't want to have a chance to influence them in a, in a proper way, if you don't want to have a chance to co-create the solution with them, then you go ahead and do exactly what everybody else has been taught for years and years and years, but is wrong instead. So, so the emailing part is wrong and the proposal part is wrong. Instead of sending in something, if you absolutely have to take it in, walk them through, and you could do it on zoom. If you, if you, they're making you send a proposal, then I would prefer that it's the repeat of the co-creation of the scope of work that you've done in the same room together by asking their for their input with parameters and what, whatever else they've tried in the past and or how many employees are involved, how many geographies are involved, what the total scope is. You, by co-creating it together, you don't have to send it in later. You can send it in while you, once you know you've already created it. You can send that in for the actual sign off. But I want you to get a preliminary sign off in the room. That's why meetings, sales meetings that talk about budget and actual spend and cost close higher, seventeen percent higher. So that's um, that's the last one. Where do I email my presentation or my my um, proposal? Don't send proposals, co-create them together and certainly don't email them because you're only going to be judged on price. You will let go of all the different criteria or all the different ways that you can overcome an objection and, and meet them where they're at and assess the situation. You don't want to lose out on all of that. So I hope this made sense for all of you. I hope this was helpful and uh, good luck and happy selling. And I will talk to you next Tuesday. All the best, everyone.